Hello there, my name is Martin, and welcome back, or welcome to the first time. This is the second part on the Xingyi Kuntao Silat series, and we are again dealing with the first root jewel. In case you are new, either look to the first video link in the description bar, or I will quickly demonstrate the first root jewel. To the side. That's it. And uh, I said I will demonstrate some variations on how this root juru can be practiced. I also want to address some training and practice methods surrounding this because Xing Yi most notably is an internal martial art. And uh, Silat also has uh, very many connections to internal training methods and these need to be addressed. So let me first show you some variations on how to go with that juro and what is in there. That's for the moment, you know, this dragon body exercise where we enter the Santi. Let's skip that for the moment. Let's just focus on the other part. We basically start in this chicken leg shape. So your knees are roughly about, and so your, your feet are together like this. Maybe two fingers between them, maybe together, maybe a slight angle. What feels comfortable? Your knees are bent so that they are just over the knees. If you lean a bit, and in Xing Yi and Silat you can lean a slight bit, so don't get me wrong, not like this. A wee bit, you can go a little bit deeper. Hands are parked here like this. They are not in the beautiful lady as in Tai Chi, but in the tiger mouth configuration. So slight, ever so slightly stretched. And now with a step forward you go into the first wedge formation. Now here is where the fun starts. Your wedge, the hand should land a second before the foot lands. Reasoning is very easy. Now my entire body weight lands on the wall. Or if you prefer, on my opponent, right? Now my entire body weight rests on my foot. So only a fraction of that is still transported by the arm. So what you want to do is to time yourselves such that the hand lands on your opponent a fraction of a second beforehand. But you also do not want to do it like batch, batch, because that obviously gives too many possibilities for your opponent to sweep your leg and make you fall down. Also imagine that you miss and your foot is still up. So this is really that up extremely quickly. It is just enough time to transfer the impact with what is landing and let the foot land there. Now, those of you who were attentive saw that I let my foot only land like this. The heel and the toe still pointing up. So, let's see. So, that is a variation, you know. First we train land, wedge, exchange. A variation on this that is much quicker than the standard form is land on the heel and while you roll your weight forward, you do the exchange. So you have two times the benefit of using gravity. This pretty much is the same thing as the Dempsey drop step. You drop your entire weight into the other guy. 
but now your weight still travels forward until it lands on the whole sole of the boot. And why waste that? You can easily, one, two, and now with a wavy motion, go for the third exchange. So, the standard Juru is just the beginning Lego piece to get you started. One, whole foot lands, you are already in that forward stance. Two, you do the torque. Three, you do again some torque. Now what we do is, we land and do some compression work on top of the landing and some torquing work. And what we get is this. And here we turn, we torque, and use the other forward falling motion. And on the third exchange we again torque and use an expansion strike. So thus we use the maximum amount of power generation methods. And we go through this not extremely fast in the beginning, so we go slow. Which isn't to say that in the end it might not be faster. And that way, just by using what happens anyway, you can transfer three times weight transfer, torque and compression <coughs> expansion into something that you do with the arm. And if, with practice you can do that with the same speed that you use when just using the arms. Look. You can do your weight changes almost as quick as that. Because that happens as quick anyway. And they have both enormous power. And the third also, because you use the appropriate power generation methods that I have uh, sketched out in the mini-series on the six dimensions of attack. Now, I wish to address some other stuff. Uh, so far we have only addressed going forward. I have shown that as well we might go back, so we have some permutations. I can go forward and then do the down slap by also going forward. Forward, forward. I can go forward, backward. I can go backward, backward. And I can go backward, forward. So, there are some permutations on how to step. Shingi, classical continental Shingi, will always go forward or on a slight angle. Silat is more versatile and therefore allows for more directions to go. Now, if you look at those permutations from the front, you will note that they are still pretty linear. Forward, drop. Forward, drop. Backward, drop. Backward, drop. Still all happening on one line, right? So, of course, we also have this stepping out to the side. If the attack comes from here, that leaves me very open. So, obviously, if we step to the side, this might be possible. So, instead of going forward with the same arm and leg, this time you can also go forward with crossed arms and legs. Like this, see? Right leg is forward, left hand is forward. And don't worry, even if the attacker is here, my groin is not open, because this is a very transitory position. One of the reasons why we always go into this chicken leg position, which is called chicken leg in Xing Yi, but the same position exists in the footwork of Silat, is here my body is, has the least resistance to torque. In other words, I can 
turn around pretty quickly. You know that what those ice skaters do. Turning around slowly, putting the arms in and suddenly going very fast. It is the same here. Here I am pretty slow when turning. Here I'm faster. And thus the chicken leg position is so emphasized because in later stages of the training it allows for very easy direction changes. So that represents my attacker. I'm hiding behind my attacker. Now I'm going out, covered, having the directional change in here. And now this quick change is only possible when I go into the chicken leg position. So make sure that you really practice going through the chicken leg position. The next thing. Now one of the other things that I wish to address are training methods. External versus internal. The last time I said in the martial arts, no matter what kind of martial art you go through, you uh, go through the progression of external and hard, external and soft, internal and hard, and internal and soft. And uh, that requires some more explanation. Because the internal martial arts, depending on what master you are talking to or whom you are talking to generally, will claim things like it is the best possible use of biomechanics on the very conservative side and on the other side they will claim that it gives you Jedi powers. And uh, the question is what is to think of this and of that and how can we make it useful? So, you have seen me with these before. Uh, this is clearly an external training method. Like I told you, this is the poor man's variation of the brass and steel rings. Uh, only this costs much less. The advantage of these is they have a lot of weight. You can, and I will go into this why this is, makes sense, you can train to do the techniques with your shoulders and arms alone. You can use more weight, but since I have to go through considerable repetitions when doing the video, takes, retakes, and another retake, I'll have lower weights. This is not my practice weight. My practice weight is what you saw me do last time with the 11 kilos on the arm. So this is just for convenience. What you can do here is use just your shoulders and your arms. Of course, this is not what you want. You want whole body power, but we know combat is a bitch. And very rarely are we afforded the luxury of good posture and good position when we are actually called into combat. Sports is a different thing, there we are allowed to set ourselves and from then on it's a question of nerves and training. Self-defense or battlefield may be different. So it behooves us to be able to use broken power, you know, single isolated limb power. Therefore it is a good thing to be able to do the technique with a lot of weight on the arms. Because if you can do it with lots of weight on the arms, you can do it quite powerfully and quickly without the weight. Obvious, right? But that is a completely external training method. Next thing what I showed you was throwing the weight out, right? That is good and bad at the same time. It is obviously good because here you have some substantial weight that you can really feel. And you can feel if you do it with your arms and shoulders or if you are actually throwing it out. Or if you are throwing it out and using arms and shoulders on top of that. With the weight you can actually easier feel that. Thus, it is a good thing. Also the body gets used to throw out a lot of weight and therefore when the time comes, the time comes and the body throws out our naked arms. They go faster and more powerful. That is the good side, the upside of training with those weights. The downside of training with these weights is that these weights, A, have a tendency to travel, as you just saw, and that even without that tendency to travel, 
we have a tendency to hold back, to stop the weight. Because if we don't, that is what happens. The weight pulls us forward. So, on the good side, it teaches balance. On the bad side, it also has the great danger of teaching us to hold back. So, I recommend doing this training first, in the order of first doing the arms. So now the arms are exhausted. You want, you want to simulate exhaustion for combat. Now, when you barely can no longer do it with your arms, now is the time to throw it out. Because now you really teach the body to throw the weight out. That gives some resting time for your arms. And now you throw it out and augment it by using the arms and shoulders on top of that. So, three times training. Training only the arms, training throwing out, and training throwing out together with the arms. Now, that is the first thing that I recommend for practicing, for conditioning, for getting stronger and more oomph into your punch. That is, however, not where we must stop. There is something else we must do after that. I'll see you after the cut. So the magical training method that comes after the weights are rubber bands. Those are three blue bands. They are rather powerful. I wrap on around my left hand. I have this the loop around my thumb. And uh, the whole thing is around my shoulder. So if I push it out, I have quite some resistance. I can also make the left arm longer, good static exercise, which makes pushing the right arm considerably more difficult. You will figure that out. And this needs to be done after you have been throwing the weights around, for the simple reason, here we don't need to hold our technique back one iota. The rubber band is holding us back. So now we can practice forward energy only. This is absolutely necessary to do after throwing the weights around because here our neurological conditioning is for forward energy and that needs to be the last thing we do so our body remembers that what we want is forward energy and not pulling back. Now the attentive among you will notice that if I hold the rubber band like this the only thing that I practice is my arms. Ah, uh, let me show you an alternative. So you see they are wrapped around this. So if I practice now, only between thumb and finger, that would be very traditional. If I do it like this, you see I have a starting position. Yeah, barely, but possible. I need to find the right angle, because this is angular. So best is I go 45 degrees, exactly with the edge. Now I'm going forward. If I using this, and the fist and pretend that it is a punching solution or perhaps even go under the arm then it gives different dynamics and you will figure out how to do that using your entire body and if you barely can do it with your arms that is the biofeedback you want because if you now engage your entire body now you can do the move. See, that is the move from the jury. So, if you do it, if you adjust the rubber band so that you can barely do it with your arms and your shoulders and your upper body, that is where you want to start. Because now, if you have the chicken leg position, if you are well right, now you can really engage your entire body power. So that needs to come after throwing the weights, in case I didn't mention that. Now, those are all external methods. And now for those who love Xing Yi for being an internal art, I will make it worse by showing yet another external training method. This is exactly what it looks like, an iron pound bag. Since I'm doing this for quite a while, this is basically sand. 25 kilograms, 
quartz sand. I bought that from the local hardware store. You could, if you are on a tight budget, also go to the next river, but then they have all kinds of germs in there, and sooner or later you risk infection and all the stuff stinks. Whereas this cost me some four bucks. It is sanitized, it doesn't stink. It already comes in a pretty sturdy plastic bag. If that bag leaves out, I wrap it with duct tape and so forth. Now, the unusual bar stools. How to condition? Imagine that I have been rubbing my hands with generous amounts of heat dye gel before I do the practice. Then I'm doing some light swinging to get the circulation going. No, this is not the kind of swinging where the hands get blue because the centrifugal force presses everything into the hands. This is just some light swinging and three or four reps will be enough. The hands are to be loose. And what you now do is what many videos in YouTube show. If you are interested in this routine, I first slap the flat hand, then I slap my back hand, then I slap the edge, then I drop my fist, then I drop my wrist, and then I drop the eagle claw, and then I repeat the whole thing on the other side. Flat, back, edge, fist, wrist, tiger claw or eagle claw. So far, so good. Ah, it gets hold, so I need duct tape soon. You do that for, well, 100, 150 reps, maybe. You rub again with Dita Joe, with generous amounts of Dita Joe. The old manuals tell you to do that every day. I beg to differ. Modern training theory clearly shows the body needs time to heal and to rest. So, if you adopt the bodybuilding uh, periodization and do it three times a week, that will be perfectly fine. My students have had good results with just doing it three times a week. Note, however, like I said, Qing Yi is an internal method and this is an external method. Yeah, well, this is not Qing Yi, this is Qing Yi Kun Tao Silat. And uh, Kun Tao always has had, and Silat has had, a much higher pressure to develop immediate applicability. Also, I want to show you the whole spectrum of what could be expected. Let me say this, if you have not started with this in your young years, if you are over 40 to mid 40, you should not start with external methods. But it is a viable method. It works well, it produces results. By the way, external or internal methods should produce tangible results within about roughly 100 days. Oh, those glorious days when we all read our first copy of Instant Iron Pounds, breaking the bricks within 100 days. For those of you who are old enough to remember this ingenious book, that back in the day when I was 18, I went to great lengths to lay my hands on that. And uh, my trading regime basically comes from there. Now, like I said, this is all external methods. You see the kettlebell swinging, the kettlebell is a good thing. Basically what I do except for kettlebells is lots of push-ups. Pull-ups, which I cannot show because the camera is not set right. And lots of lots of squats, usually with his cousins, lots of sand sacks in a duffel bag on my back. So that is the external training regimen, that is a good thing. It will get you so far. However, first of all, no matter, and it will give you attributes, the usual attributes. Toughness from this, strength from the lots of push-ups and pull-ups and what have you. But you will, no matter how hard you train, how, how intelligent you train, smart and hard, you will always find a guy that is bigger and harder than you. So therefore you have your combat techniques to outmaneuver the guy 
but you will always, always find a guy who maybe is also more skillful than you. And if you get my age, you will most of the time find younger guys than yourself. So eventually you begin to wonder, are there not other training methods? And there we begin to transition to the internal martial arts. And uh, I will now show you a Shen Yi conditioning practice that, by scholarly definitions and common denomination, is being classified and categorized as internal. Also about conditioning, toughening up the arms. Look. This time the arms are swung down rather vehemently, but by sinking the body. So I drop my body and that drops the arms. So now I get much more blood in my hands. And when I have done that for a couple of times, 20 is more than enough. You should get a swelling feeling in the hands. And what you do now, you drop it on your thighs. Ouch. Yeah, that hurts. And so forth. You augment that beforehand by doing standing meditation, which you also augment with certain very specific visualizations and imaginations. You do that also beforehand with certain breath work and then you do the swinging and the thigh bashing. So I personally don't see much difference between bashing my thighs and bashing the sandbag. So why is the one called internal and why is the other called external? The best of my research shows that much of these distinctions between internal and external training are arbitrary. It is categorized as internal because it belongs to Xing Yi, which is categorized as an internal art, and because you start with standing meditation, you continue with standing breath work, which are both counted internal, and eventually you bash your thighs. And since two of the three exercises are definitely noted internal, the whole thing is categorized as internal. But you see that the distinction between internal and external is a bit fishy. I will give you the biggest difference between external and internal is you can barely overdo this. This has an inbuilt biofeedback mechanism called pain. If you hit too hard and risk injuring yourselves, on your thighs or on your hand, it hurts so bad you cannot go on, no matter how tough you are. Or at least I have not seen anybody who could hit tougher than his health allows. So this stops you from overtraining quite efficiently. Therefore, I prefer that method. It also yields the results of breaking the bricks in about 100 days. So why go for something like this if you can instead hit yourselves, especially when we are only using palm. So that is the one side. Um, let me address some other internal training method. Now, what am I doing here? Preparation for skiing. After all, I'm living in Austria, right? No, this is an internal training method. Look carefully. Yeah, that's it. Two long poles above my height. I grip the upper end of the poles. I suddenly let go, drop my arms and grip down there again. End of story. That's it. Internal training method. And I bet it's easy for you to see where the benefit of this lies and why this might even be preferable to this. But what about... Uh, so, what's the secret of that? Before I go into what is the secret of the dropping hand on the pole exercise, I must go into something about internal martial arts. The word internal martial arts obviously is 
an English word and not a Chinese word. The problem with that is English as an Indo-European language is a rather straightforward language. Chinese is what they usually call a multi-layered language. And in other words, one word can have, in the same context, many more meanings. In our language, it is so one word can have several meanings and the meaning becomes clear in the context. The Chinese have managed to give one word different meanings in the same context. And internal martial arts is one of those examples. So, here are some of the meanings of what internal martial arts means that I have collected over time. First of all, internal martial arts are those martial arts that come from Taoism, that are associated with uh, Wudangshan, with Maoshan, with Huashan, with the Taoist hermits, because they come from China, are therefore internal. Versus the Buddhist martial arts that are most notably associated with Shaolin. And you know, the most famous patriarch from Shaolin was Bodhidharma Dhamo, an Indian monk who came to China. Hence, his martial arts are external, as in not from China. So, one meaning of internal martial arts versus external martial arts is internal martial arts have originated in China, external martial arts have had their origins from outside China. By that very definition, Western boxing or Thai boxing would be an external martial art. Another definition that is equally valid of what an internal and an external martial art is. No matter what kind of monastery you had, Wudang or Shaolin or what have you, they needed to finance themselves and partly they financed themselves as universities for the sons of the rich and the powerful. Pretty much like Harvard or UCLA or uh, other universities these days do. In other words, you want your son to have a good education, to learn martial arts, to learn literature and what have you. So you send him to a place where he can learn. And that would be the monasteries. Now they had internal students, the monks, and external students, the son of the rich and the powerful. And obviously the curricula were partly the same and partly not. And those martial arts that were taught to the outsiders were the external martial arts. Those martial arts that were only taught to the insiders, to the monks, were the internal martial arts. There you have it, a totally different definition of what internal and external martial art is. And Chinese are able to use both in the same sentence and transfer both meanings, especially the old classical Chinese. I don't know about modern day communist China, but in the old days they were a pretty nifty bunch when it came to encoding meaning in an innocently looking sentence. But that is still not all. Another meaning, and that is the one that is most notably known in the West, is that the external martial arts train muscles by pumping iron, train the bone and the tendons by hitting heavy objects, and uh, so forth. The internal martial arts, on the other hand, practice Jedi powers with the mind. They cultivate your chi and therefore enable you to defeat your opponent at the mere touch of the hand. And the masters are known to defeat you even without a touch. Also, the hippie pipe dream goes. The reality of it is, of course, as we have seen a bit more fishy since the actual practice, the difference between internal and external training methods is not so big. In fact, it is rather so. External to internal is a progression. Because Hunga Kung Fu, you know? Most notably and most arguably, and in case you think that I'm cheating, you know, Hunga Kung Fu. The most external style there is starts external. Eventually, they go to a form that they call iron wire form which is noted as a completely internal form. 
And what the Hongar Seafoods tell you is we start external and work our way to internal. In the West, the epitome of the internal martial arts stands extremely, starts extremely soft. Everything is soft. They hit. They hit hard. <sighs> if you have not experienced how hard a true Tai Chi man or woman with the case maybe can hit, seek out someone who is knowledgeable about that. And you know just how hard they can hit. And uh, so, also, if you see a beginner in Tai Chi, you see that he also begins with very hard edgy external movements. If you see someone who is more advanced, the same move looks like some algae flowing in water. And if you see a true master, it looks again much softer than what I demonstrate here. One of the differences is indeed the External martial arts start training your muscles. Then they go down training your fascia. Then they go down training even deeper layers of your tissue. Eventually they train your bones, your bone marrow, and there is no deeper layer than your bone marrow. So if they go even deeper with their attention, they start entering the realm where our feelings, our perception and our focus reside. And there they cross the border to the internal martial arts. The internal martial arts do the exact opposite. They start out focusing inward, usually in the Dantian, which it ideally is a point where there is no physical equivalent. So you literally focus your attention something that is physically not there until you feel it and then you bring it out. The claim is, oh well, doing that with a feeling is very easy or rather not too difficult. The claim of the internal martial arts is that this is combatively useful and it's also the claim is that it is useful for healing hearts. And, uh, well, we all know that our mental focus determines what our body can do. Imagine you are doing, again, push-ups. And now you are doing this last rep. Because you master the last bit of anger that you have. You finally can get out this last rep before you collapse. And so, obviously, and if you had not mastered that anger, you would not have been able to do that. So you have an easy proof of concept that mental focus influences bodily performance. I will give you something else. Stand loosely like this. Use the immortal man points the way gesture. Point before you imagine that a laser is shooting out. Look where that laser is reflected. Now turn as much as you can and note how far your body will maximally turn. Now imagine turning again and imagine turning farther. And easily you will turn much farther. So you can test that yourself. What we do only with our mind has a strong effect on what our body can do and will do. And that is what the internal martial arts exploit. And so there is something behind their claim that if you bring out a feeling from where there is nothing physically, that you can use that physically. And uh, since I do not only wish to annoy you with 
words let me show you if she just pushes me you see being stronger and everything than her there is not much as you can see not much is going on there right I'm bigger and stronger so what is she going to do and this was not fake this was a wavy motion that is classically already counted to the internal martial arts. What she did was a wave motion. Look carefully at what her body does. And the way to you thank you. And why she can utilize that wave emotion is because of the internal practice. I found and many others found it is almost impossible to utilize this wave emotion by external practice or doing uh, with, without using your mind to start first. Now that is borderlining what we just saw, external and internal. True internal arts claim that you don't see any physical movement and through just your Jedi powers, the other guy falls down. I have read claims that if a true internal master touches you, you will feel so bad, so sick that you collapse on the floor. Well, actually I have made my own experiences with that. The problem with such claims of Jedi powers is if you watch that YouTube video, you can believe them or you cannot believe them. But there is no way you could immediately or instantly check them out yourselves. Whereas this, you can check out yourselves and uh, with proper training, this wavy motion and how to apply it, you can check out yourselves. Because one thing about those Jedi powers, may they exist or not, everybody will tell you it takes decades to develop them. Okay, so what do I do in the meantime? Walk around every danger, cower under the bed so the thugs won't find me. Until I have developed my Jedi powers. <laughs> we all know that this is not how it works. So. Jedi powers are something that it certainly inspires us if we think they are possible. It will certainly make us train. And if then, after a lifetime of practice, we find out Jedi powers don't exist, we will still have had a lot of fun practicing in that direction. And if we find out they do exist, all the more power to us. Meanwhile, I would like to have the presentation in this channel focused on what is still testable and attainable with some months or only a couple of years of training. Uh, one last thing, internal practice can be very joyful and very ecstatic. So I know this is a martial arts channel and I will get some flack for it, but if you think along the lines of total body orgasm, you wouldn't be totally wrong. That is something that is quite possible with internal practice. And like I said, if you practice in the right way, 100 days give you tangible results. I wish you a sweet night. Thank you for watching.